Stanford Medicine recently discovered new COVID-19 variants here in the Bay Area. Joining us now to talk about that is Dr. Malavi Srinivasan with Stanford Healthcare. Good to see you. First of all, can you tell us about those variants and if we should be concerned? Thanks, Len. Yes, we should definitely be concerned about the new mutations that we're seeing in the coronavirus. Um, as you know, the nature of viruses is to mutate. And a lot of the mutations uh, are ineffectual so that the, the virus can't actually invade. But we're seeing two new mutations that are very concerning. Uh, one is the UK variant that uh, is the B117 that uh, we talked about uh, over the past month or two um, that seems to be more sticky and more abundant, but recently the uh, UK authorities reported that it might actually be more deadly as well, which we didn't think it was initially. And the second is a concerning strain that's coming out of both uh, Brazil and out of South Africa that we're finding in the US as as well uh, that's called a B1351 and it has a mutation in the spike protein which is where the uh, protein, the, uh, the virus attaches to the receptors in the human body. And uh, this is making the uh, virus more deadly. And so we're, we're all very concerned about it. We know that the UK virus, when it swept through England, became the dominant strain in about three months. Um, we're seeing the same thing here. It's about a five to uh, seven times more uh, sticky and contagious. And uh, so between that and some of the additional um, uh, things we're seeing about the, uh, uh, the UK, uh, the South African and the Brazilian variants, uh, we, I think, as a community need to be very careful in how we interact with each other. So there's a couple things to consider when we're thinking about these viruses. Uh, and the first one is, can the current vaccines give us enough immunity to become protective? And I think that's the big question that we have with these mutations. Sure, they may be more contagious, and some of them look like they're actually quite more deadly. And um, uh, what we're finding is that the current vaccines uh, may have some partial protection uh, against these new variants, but the amount of antibody that we need, which is sort of the uh, proteins that our body makes to help us fight these infections, the uh, result of the vaccination, need to be somewhere in the order of six to 200 times higher than we need for the regular strain that was first identified in China. So um, uh, we think that uh, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, maybe with a booster, uh, may give us enough immune response. Uh, we're a little bit more concerned about some of the other vaccines that may uh, not confer enough immunity. So I think the take homes for this are a couple things. The first is that um, uh, we need a national sequencing strategy, the same way we need a national testing strategy to be able to identify emerging strains and emerging threats. And the second is we need to fix our vaccine supply and distribution. Third is we have to really consider as a community, should we start doing not only um, antibody te testing to see if you're positive or negative, but antibody titer testing to see how high your antibody levels are. And especially for those people who are most vulnerable. So people who are elderly, people who are immunocompromised, like who've had a liver transplant or getting cancer therapy, or are really potentially very sick for other reasons. Should for those people we be doing uh, antibody titer testing and second, and the, the final thing, fourth, is to think about how we need to address what we call vaccine hesitancy, which is the reluctance of a percentage of people in the community to actually get uh, vaccinated when we know they're both very safe and very effective. And how did the team discover the new variants we've been talking about? Right. So this goes along, uh, Len, with the testing strategy that uh, uh, and the sequencing strategy that I'd mentioned earlier. So uh, Stanford has started a massive uh, viral sequencing strategy for the entire Bay Area. We're trying to sequence every positive test that comes through Stanford and a variety of um, uh, sequences of all of the other uh, COVID positive patients in the Bay Area. So in England, uh, they have a national testing, a sequencing strategy where they're uh, sequencing 10% of all of the coronaviruses that are detected, which means that they can kind of get ahead of the curve in figuring out what mutations are coming out that might be uh, uh, making you more sick. Um, in the U.S., we've only had 0.3% if, if even that, 
of uh, people uh, who are getting coronavirus having their sequences done. So uh, this is one of the first large scale sequencing strategies in the US. And uh, we've already identified the, uh, the B117 UK variant, but we haven't found the uh, South African and Brazilian variants yet. Um, and uh, although they have been found in non-travelers in South Carolina, so these spontaneous mutations are probably happening all over the place. They're just being found in one country or the other first. So that the take home for this is that the vaccinations don't guarantee that you won't get sick and that six feet is probably not enough social distancing uh, with these new variants that seem to be both more deadly and more contagious. Um, uh, so 10 to 15 feet apart, uh, even when we're outdoors is probably much better. But the other two things to remember is that uh, if you wear a fitted N95 mask and you wear a face shield, uh, that's incredibly protective. It's the strategy that we use in a healthcare setting is to make sure that we don't get sick. So if you're taking care of someone in the emergency department or in the ICU, the transmission rates are very low to healthcare providers because we're appropriately using our, our personal protective equipment. And the last thing is to remember that because about 50% of people are asymptomatic when they get COVID and they're shedding for a few days even before they get sick, you have to assume that everybody you meet is infected, um, especially because we're having more deadly strains come out. And with all those things you've mentioned, even the distance, I know we've heard six feet for so long. Do you think we could see another significant surge in COVID-19 cases due to the variants? I think we're going to probably see a surge unless people really take the social distancing seriously. You know, we saw a big surge after Thanksgiving. We didn't see as much of a surge as we thought we might after Christmas because I think people were being very careful. But you know, people have quarantine fatigue and they've got pandemic fatigue. And especially as the weather starts to get nicer, I think that uh, um, it's possible that people will be less careful. So uh, even if you get vaccinated, the message has to be that we can't be less careful. And you know, by May, only 40% of the US population is going to be vaccinated. And if you kind of think about the two new variants that are coming out, there's uh, a couple institutes that have done some modeling, including these variants to see what's going to happen to our country. And as you know, you know, almost half a million people, 450,000 people have died of COVID so far and COVID related complications. Um, and uh, uh, with these two new variants, uh, it's going to be somewhere around 650,000 thousand people by May. And uh, we can really bring that down if we uh, uh, continue social distancing and uh, if we really try to practice uh, best behavior so that we are honoring ourselves and then our families and communities. Yeah, unreal to hear that number. And there's more. It seems like there's always more when it comes to COVID. Some COVID-19 cases are also now linked to new cases of diabetes. What do we know about those cases? Well, you know, diabetes is a condition that affects about 10% of the population, and it's a condition where your blood sugar is high. And it's high either because your body has a hard time using circulating sugar for energy, which is called type 2 diabetes, uh, and it's associated with metabolic syndrome, or because your pancreas doesn't make enough insulin to help your body use sugar, and that's called type 1 diabetes. And so here's what's different with COVID. Normally, when people get very sick or if they get steroids or blood sugar goes up. Um, but then once you are no longer sick and uh, you're off the steroids, your blood sugar comes back down again. With COVID, what we're finding is when people get sick, some people are requiring extremely high doses of insulin beyond what we would normally expect, like two or three times more. And then a percentage of those are having uh, long-term diabetes. Now, we don't know exactly how many. Um, uh, the And it, it's either because uh, the uh, COVID vaccine, the, the COVID virus is infecting the pancreas cells through the ACE2 receptors, which is the uh, entry site receptor for the body, uh, or um, uh, because it's triggering the uh, body to attack the pancreas, as it's done in other circumstances, or uh, it's because uh, it's causing some metabolic changes, so we can't use sugar as well. So um, uh, it's kind of a hybrid, it looks like, between some type 1 and type 2. Um, what we can learn from the 2003 SARS outbreak is that uh, um, 
in small studies where people had had COVID, about 40 or 50 people of them, uh, excuse me, had had diabetes, uh, 40 or 50 uh, people um, uh, after having SARS, they uh, had about 10% uh, um, or 20% of people who were sent home with diabetes after being sick. And then, but at two years, only two people still had diabetes. So our hope is that the current uh, uh, diabetes that we're seeing associated with COVID um, will uh, get better over time as the body heals from the damage done by COVID and all of the associated complications of the revved up immune system. But we don't know yet. And uh, this is certainly a, a different virus than the first SARS. Yeah, something else to watch and see. February is also a heart health month. What is your message to those who maybe putting off medical care due to concerns about the coronavirus. Gosh, uh, Len, my message is this. Please, please, please make sure that you take care of your standard health screens. And if you have any symptoms of heart disease, please go see your doctor. Now, heart disease, although I know we're all concerned about COVID, heart disease is still the number one killer of men and women around the world. And since the pandemic started, there's been an 11% increase in deaths um, in the United States from heart disease. And people are putting off necessary care because they're concerned uh, about their health, right? Um, uh, over three quarters of people are concerned about getting COVID if they go in for care. And about half of them, including you know, 60, 65% of people who have heart disease have been putting off screening and checkups. And this is the concerning thing, is that a third of people who have cardiac symptoms have not been seeking care when they have had symptoms. And so here's what I'd like people to know, is that first, um, we have lots of options to provide care to people. The first is through virtual care and telemedicine. And as you know, this has been uh, now a very common way of delivering high quality care to people, and we're getting it right. And the second thing is that if you come in to see your physician in the Bay Area, the Bay Area has been very good about making sure that um, uh, we've paid attention to our ventilation systems. So the HVAC systems and the uh, filtration systems are um, uh, filtering out virus and circulating many times an hour that people have personal protective equipment when you go in to see them. And the healthcare workers have been vaccinated for the most part in the Bay Area. So this, it's a very safe environment and people are very careful about social distancing and making sure that we're creating a safe an environment to take care of everybody as possible. So please, if you have symptoms, uh, please, please uh, make sure that you are getting evaluated appropriately and please don't put off your standard health screenings. Yeah, a very important message. Dr. Malathi Srinivasan with Stanford HealthCare, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Len.